Let's talk about that Dan Gable match. It happened in 1975 at the Northern Open, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about the match. You won seven to six over Gable. There's some people that say it was at the Olympic trials and that it was on his way back. So, I mean, there's, let's flesh out what really happened. Uh, a lot of people point to Gable was coming back. He had been off for two or three years, had a neck injury, but you also had an injury four months prior to that. So going into that, you guys meet in the finals of the Northern Open in 1975. So that's the reality of it your interpretation of what happened and what it was like to wrestle your idol? It, it, to, for me, I, I'm glad you asked me those questions earlier because what I'm going to say now will make perfect sense. Um, I thought it was probably the, the greatest thing that could ever happen to me to wrestle my idol, to wrestle somebody of that stature. Um, if you were a great pitcher, like say now in 2020, if you could go back in a time machine machine and pitch against Babe Ruth. Wouldn't you want to do that? Right? I mean, that's how I, I think. So I was excited about the opportunity to wrestle Dan in an actual match. My coach tried to discourage me from it. I mean, he, I guess he thought it was, it would ruin my confidence or something. I guess uh, he and Dan had the, it's like I was going to get killed in that match or something. I mean, my coach really tried to, to discourage me in the best way he could to get me to change weight classes, don't wrestle Gable. You shouldn't do it, Lee, it doesn't make sense. It's not gonna help you and all that. And then my coach, one last ditch effort to try to get me, he said, Lee, you said you wanted to be undefeated this year. You know, you, you came up a little short last year in the NCAA finals. You said to me, I don't wanna lose another college match. And I did say that to him, at, right, in Princeton after I lost Diego. He said, now you're not gonna be able to do that. You're not gonna be able to achieve that goal that you had. And, and that still didn't stop me from wanting to, to wrestle Dan. And it wasn't because I thought I was going to win. I was that confident in myself. I just wanted to not miss that opportunity to wrestle against this legend. To me, that was, I always wanted to wrestle against the very best wrestlers. Um, like in high school, not to divert a little bit, but in high school, when I won the state tournament uh, my senior year uh, in the smaller schools, Mike Deanna won the state in the bigger schools. We're in the same weight class. So there was a tournament that we both entered purposely so we could wrestle each other. Uh, Mike was of that mindset, Deanna, and so was I. We wanted to challenge each other to see who was best. And I won by one point. It was like close match. But the mindset of champions want to wrestle the best. And so I was very uh, focused on that match. In fact, my teammates, no, no one gave me a chance. No, no one, I mean, people, they laughed at me when I was warming up for the match. I mean, I've had teammates say, Lee, why are you warming up? Why, why do you look so intense? I was warming up, run, you know, like really intensely focused on that match. And they, people, and so I just walked out of the gym and went in the back room somewhere, told my coach where I was and said, come get me when it's ready. Because I didn't want to have any distractions of people just, <clears throat> like not taking the match seriously because I took it seriously. And my coach, <clears throat> uh, in my documentary, as you might recall, he, he, uh, he makes a comment about how focused I was going into that match. And he said, that's not what Lee Kemp was thinking. You know, he was thinking, but you got to put it in your mind first that you want to do something great. It doesn't matter if it happens or not. So, um, you know, as the match went on, I could see that I could wrestle with him. You know, it was, it was close. And uh, he wasn't beating me up. So I just kept giving me more confidence as the match went on. And the key to that match is the last 30 seconds. That is, it's just the way the universe works. <laughs> the way God works, I would say, you know. It, 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 made, it gave us both an opportunity to win the match. And it was the opportunity for Lee Kemp to understand how winning works and how the mind works. <clears throat> I thought that he was going to win because he was in really on a, a bear hug even. I took the single, he went up to a bear hug and it was really tight. And I looked at the clock and I thought, man, I'm not going to win this match now, you know? I just didn't see how I was going to get out of that. But, I, but then as quickly as I thought about that, the thought left my mind and I started thinking back to how can I win this match? So it went from 
I'm not going to win to how can I win this match. All my thought process went to how can I win this match. It wasn't that I'm going to win the match. It was what can I do now, right now, to win this match. And I just kept that thought moment by moment by moment. And that's what I tell wrestlers. You, you have to be in the moment. And if you watch that last sequence, you could just see the moment. I totally relaxed. And because I got so relaxed, it didn't give Dan the pressure that he needed to actually get the takedown. I was very relaxed in that, those last 20 seconds. I was just floating with him. And I don't know how I thought to do that at that time. And I just, it was like, it was like a moment in time that was, that was peaceful and was calm. I couldn't feel a strength. I just flowed with him. I knew that I, you know, I just float, floated and I just stayed in the moment. And uh, I used strength when I had to. I, I let my mind relax to where I, I could move where I needed to move my body to, to counteract his force a little bit. And then he finally let go and tried to shoot in again. I just floated against that. And it just taught me mentally how you can stay in the moment and focus on what you need to do to win rather than all the myriad of things that could cause you to lose. And that's what wrestlers do all the time. You think about everything that could go wrong. I just I wasn't necessarily thinking about what could go right. I just stayed in the moment. Like, what do I have to do right now to win? He shot, I got a spa. He bear hugged me, I got a wizard. Um, I got to float a little bit. I got to post my hand. I got to hook my leg. I got to, you have to stay in the moment. So, and then when the buzzer went off, it was crazy. I just, it was like, wow, that's how you do it. <laughs> that's how you win big. You just stay in the moment and you just, and you just, you just keep believing in yourself. Um, you know, uh, Rick Longer, <clears throat> a former Badger wrestler, said something in a quote. I, I use it as a quote now because he was Wisconsin's first national champion. And he was kind of the sort of a mentor to me going to Wisconsin. But he said that, you know, no one has a crystal ball, which we don't. He said, no one has a crystal ball. No one knows whether they're gonna win or not. He said, but the one thing we do know is, is we know our own abilities. And Rick Longwear said, I knew I was confident. I knew I had a certain amount of abilities. And I knew it was possible for me to win. And then once you know those things, then if it's if something's possible, then you keep trying, all right? You keep trying, it's possible. But you have to keep trying with knowledge and do smart things. I see you can't do dumb things out there and get down by 10 points. If you're down by just one point, or if the score's tied, or if you're winning by just one point, you're always in a way, you're always in the place where you can win that match. So you know it's possible. So I knew, just like Rick, when Rick said those words, it just made perfect sense to me. It was a quote that I use all the time now. I, no one has a crystal ball. We don't know if we're going to win or not, but we know it's possible. You know, I knew I was confident. And then the, the other thing Rick said is, I knew I was confident in my abilities. And then this is a key thing. He said, I knew how to focus. So in that match with Gable in that last 30 seconds, I could focus very quickly. In that moment, I could keep focus in that moment. A lot of wrestlers lose focus. You see it, they just kind of, like how does someone get your leg with 20 seconds left if they've never touched your leg the whole match? We see it all the time in wrestling, right? All of a sudden, the last 20 seconds, <laughs> the, the losing wrestler gets in and he almost gets a takedown and then it's at the buzzer kind of a thing. Well, that wrestler lost focus. Uh, it rarely ever happened to me. You know. um, it did happen, though. It happens because we're human. But I think I had the ability to, 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 to focus. I had the confidence in myself and in my abilities. Uh, didn't mean I, I knew I was going to win. I just, I just knew that I had a really, 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 really high probability of winning. I was very confident in my ability. I knew it was very, very likely that I was going to win every match. I, I believe that. I didn't know it was going to happen that way, but I believed that it could happen. So that's all you have in life. I mean, no one knows they're going to even get up the next day. No one knows we're going to, 
our heart's going to keep beating. We don't know that as a, as a fact, but we have a pretty high probability. If, if we're in good health, typically, and we keep ourselves in shape, we eat right, whatever, or I'm, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like I'm going to get up tomorrow. I feel like I'm going to wake up tomorrow. So I felt like I was going to win matches because I was doing everything right. Now, using that same example, if you have a bad lifestyle, you smoke, you drink, you're, you're high blood pressure, you're obese, those people, I mean, in addition to all the other fatal things that could happen at random, they have a high probability of not waking up tomorrow because of all the bad stuff they do already, you know? So, so the way my mind works is that if I can position myself in the best possible way I can by being in shape, by being strong, by being around great coaches, by getting enough sleep, having a good lifestyle, all that stuff, and having confidence in the way I've trained and all that. When I walk on the mat, I'm pretty confident that I can win, you know? And, and I go after the match that way. And um, so when I walked out against Gable, I had all that stuff in my mind. And, and the last thing that, that I'll say about it is that I was able to focus. And that is probably one of the single most things that will help someone be successful with anything is your ability to focus on that one thing and then take us through what you call the rocky three moment at the end of that oh, movie, my goodness rocky balboa and clubber lang they <laughs> want to go behind closed doors except you're rocky and gable is club or is uh <laughs> apollo creed i said clubber lang, <laughs> apollo creed so you guys had your rocky three moment where you guys went into closed quarters no one was there you guys battled it out what happened in that moment? You know, that it, it was uh, amazing that that happened that way. But uh, the Northern Open was in November, I don't know, 15, mid-November mid or something like that. And and I, I was a, I won against Gable. So the next week was the Northern Iowa tournament. So the buzz, and this is before the internet. So without the internet even, the buzz quickly spun around that Gable's going to be there to wrestle Kemp, you know. And so that whole week prior to that, a tournament in Northern Iowa, I was training extra hard thinking, okay, Dan's gonna, he's gonna wanna to, to avenge that loss. So I get to the tournament and, and I see Dan's got his street clothes on, he's coaching. And I see that I went to my bracket, his name's not there, and he's not in the tournament. So we kept kind of eyeing each other up through the whole tournament. Didn't say anything to each other, but you know, I, he, would, he would see me and I'd see him. And, and so I, I ended up winning, and so anyway, not long after that, this was around Thanksgiving now, <clears throat> and this was the Olympic year, so they were having these Olympic developmental training camps, and because Russ Hullickson was, you know, had a, we had a great freestyle program, we had one of the freestyle developmental camps there, so all the best wrestlers in the country came there, because it was a freestyle developmental camp for the, all, like, like before, I think it was, uh, I think the Olympic team was set by then, probably, or or it was no, it was it was it was in the process of being set. So while we were at that camp, we had all the different people there. Gable was there coaching and all that stuff, and I was there. So after one of the practices, and because it was at Wisconsin, I stayed late, you know, and uh, I was I thought I was the only guy in the locker room actually. And this is the funny thing. Uh, Dwayne Clubman, my coach, must have just been there working late, so he came down just to see what was going on in the restroom. room. <clears throat> and it was just, um, it was just me sitting there. I was taking my shoes off. I was getting ready to leave the restroom, actually. And he said, Lee, I think Dan wants to work out with you. He's, he's in the back of the restroom. I just saw him. He's in the corner there, and he's just, I think you should, you should go work out with him. And I didn't even know Dan was in the restroom. room. He was so quiet back there. He was just shallow wrestling. And so I put my shoes back on. I went back there, and sure enough, he was back there kind of in a corner, just shadow wrestling, sparring by himself. And it was, we were the only two guys in the whole building, I think. And my coach had left. I noticed he had just walked out. And so I asked Dan to say, say you want to wrestle? And we wrestled for the next hour just trying to kill each other. It was intense, man. It was the most – and I think he needed to get that out of the system. I think he needed that. And I think we benefited each other during that time because it helped me to deal with this guy who was like, 
Dan Gable plus two. You know, he wanted to, in his mind, he wanted to prove himself, man. What is, you know, he, I think he just wanted to figure out, like, what happened. And he, he got the better of me during that exchange, actually. I'll have to admit that. But, uh, but, the, uh, but, but we, both, uh, we both wrestled really hard. We both uh, gained, I gained more confidence because I was able to do really well against him. I scored, of course. He scored probably more. But, uh, but we, were, we really went after each other really hard. And, uh, and there was no stopping. Like if we got on the edge of the mat by the benches, I'm thinking, okay, normally in practice we stop. He didn't stop, and I I learned something. I said, okay, he's not going to stop. You know, he pulled me back on the mat. He just kept me down. So, I, you know, and then I noticed he wasn't going to let me go after a takedown. If you're going to get away, you're going to get away on your own. So I started to learn right from that one exchange that you have to continuously wrestle and fight through all holes, and that's something that Dan preaches to his team when he coached. I learned firsthand because this dude was not going to let me go. He wasn't going to give me a break. And uh, he was trying to beat me up in the wrestling vernacular, not beat me up really, but he was going to, he was going to maul me if he could, if I was going to not rise up to his level of intensity, he would have mauled me that day. So I, I learned how to be really, really intense. It brought things out of me. I didn't know I even had when you wrestle Dan for an hour, I mean, you, you might be able to beat Dan in six minutes just because you're ahead on points when the buzzer goes off. But in an hour with no official, with no stopping, you know, under benches, <laughs> pulling back on the mat, it, it's almost like a fight, but it's a wrestling fight. So that one exchange, just it, it, just, it just made me a way better wrestler. I learned how to break people. I learned how to be intense if I had to. And from that moment on, Dan and I were workout partners. Whenever I was anywhere around him, we worked out. Because Dan liked to work out anyway. And I think he loved to work out with people that challenged him. And I challenged him quite a bit, actually. So he always would work out with me, always. Whenever I would ask him, he would always. And I asked him whenever he was around. So from that moment on, we worked out almost every day. And then... Uh, during the Olympic belt, during, during the Olympic process, I worked out with them. When I made my world teams, I worked out with them probably as much as anybody else in the whole room. He was the coach. This is fascinating because I consider you and Dan one of the top five greatest American wrestlers, you being one and Dan being one. And to actually have you guys practice, we don't have to ask questions about you know, what would it look like? But it sounds like you sought him out and he was always giving of his time regardless of the circumstance. Didn't you drive hours to go seek him out to be able to get the best competition with him? Absolutely. One, my junior year in college, uh, that was the only summer I didn't make a team. So it was like a failure that I had. Uh, or I, I guess my sophomore year too, I didn't make the Olympic team, but I was an alternate. So I got, I got to go to, to Montreal to watch, you know, uh, John Peterson win his gold medal and all that stuff. So um, in 1977, I tried to make the World University Games team. I lost to Wade Chalice, which bothers me to this day, but, but, but Wade's a great wrestler, you know. But so that summer, I, was, I, was, I, I went home to visit my parents, and I was looking through amateur wrestling news, and I saw that Dan was going to be, uh, you know, one of the clinicians at a camp down in Columbus, Ohio. And I knew that was about four hours away. So I, they had a phone number there and I called to make sure Dan was going to be there. They said, yeah, he's coming in today or tomorrow, tomorrow, whatever. I said, yeah, he's going to be there tomorrow. Yep. And so, you know, that was just whoever answered the phone. I knew he was going to be there. So that's all. I didn't talk to Dan. There was no cell phones then. I just drove down to Columbus and I was, I got there when the session started and there was Dan. He was teaching, teaching the, the whole group of wrestlers. And I waited in the back, of the, the back of the session until it was all over. So he taught for like two hours. When it was over, I walked up and asked me if he wanted to work out. And he said yes. So we worked out for about an hour and a half. And he did that for me and him. I don't know. I guess he liked working out. But I think he did it because, because he knew that I was wanting. He knew that I wanted that. And I mean, like, how many coaches would do that? You know, to go with a guy like me, a physical like me, who, I mean, like that was hard. We worked out really hard. 
I mean, really hard. We just, as we always did. And so when it was all over, I showered, he showered, and I drove back up to Chardon, and he went wherever he was going. 